Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be in church today. Amen. That's all right. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. It is good to be in the Lord's house today. I'd like to welcome everyone to New Life Pentecostal Church where we believe that you can be rescued, redeemed, and restored. Amen. I want to thank everyone for being here. And there are still some that could not be here today. Uh, that it's always the case. But if you're here, we're glad you're here and we welcome you here today. We had a tremendous service last night. If you, if you made it to church last night, you were touched, moved, and blessed of God. Amen. And, and you, you, uh, you, have, you robbed yourself of an opportunity to be fed in a deep way. But if you're here today, you're going to be fed again, both spiritually and with some good food a little bit later. Amen. All right, we got just a few announcements and a few things we're going to do before we start service. Number one, I need to say that the ladies will be doing a cookie swap next Sunday at 5 p.m. Uh, where's my wife? My wife is right there. All right, well, hold your hand up, Sister Laura. If, you'd, if you're a lady and you'd like to participate, just see her sometime today, and she'll give you all the details. If you don't already have them, she'll give them to you. Also, just around the corner, we're going to be doing this, so I'm going ahead and getting the word out now. Every year, the jail ministry uh, out of this church, uh, we take snack cakes for the holidays into the jail, and we call it snack cakes for inmates. Uh, if you would like to participate and help, uh, if you will bring boxes of snack cakes by December 11th, start bringing those in. Also, and I skipped an announcement, I know I did it, I'm going back, Angel Tree, Angel Tree, they're working on it. All right, so I'm looking for Sister, Sister Danielle. She may be in the nursery. She's already done a good job of this. I'm going to brag on that. The angel tree was set up this morning. Every year, this church, uh, we do our best to help families in need that do not have the, the means to do Christmas for their children. It's already set up and ready. If you would like to help, what I want you to do is go by that tree and take off one of the ornaments. And let me explain them to you. If you get a star... That's one gift for, for a child. If you get an angel, that's all of the gifts that one child is needing. So and a star is very simple. It's one gift. An angel, you've bought that child's whole Christmas. Also, uh, and this is really what I wanted to do this morning. I need to give, before we do anything else, I need to issue a thank you to some people. Is that all right? Is that okay? I think that a thank you is in order. First off, I want to honor brother and sister being the bishop here at the church for their years of service. I want to honor them uh, for just being faithful uh, in many cases, an elder pastor that's still here and affiliated with the church become a stumbling block and a hindrance because they won't turn it loose and let the next generation uh, lead the church. But they have stayed here and remained faithful and they've allowed me to build on the foundation that was laid before me. And for that, I'm thankful. So I want to ask Brother and Sister Bean to step forward. Uh, Brother Gary and, and Sister Bean, if you guys will step forward, I'll honor you guys. Let's do that this morning. They served this church faithfully in pastoring for 23 years. Amen. And, and we owe them a great, great debt of gratitude. Now, in my notes, it says everything else. But everything else is, is important. I want to begin now by thanking all of the Silver Sisters of the church. I want to thank the trustees. I want to thank, the, and let's only say this, the trustees have been with me since the concept of that new building. They have worked alongside of me uh, with the architect, looking at plans, reviewing things. They've helped labor. They've sat through the meetings where we stressed about money uh, and all those things. And we, they helped put their nose to the grindstone. And they've been behind me 100%. And they've been here for this church. I also want to thank the ministry team and the elders of this church. You are faithful and your support and encouragement is 
uh, is felt and appreciated. I want to thank every Tuesday night worker. If you have shown up here on a Tuesday night and worked at this church, I thank you right now. Amen. They, they deserve it. I want to thank Brother Dennis and Brother Daryl Barnes. They took time out of their regular schedule work uh, and worked at the church and did the plumbing at the church. So when you have uh, clean water, drinking fountains, toilets that flush over there, thank them. Amen. I want to thank uh, our Saturday workday crews for all of their hard work. I want to thank Wyatt General Contractor. Uh, without them, we could not have gotten where we are right now. Also, Sunday school teachers, for the last 12 months, your patience and, and your faithfulness and hard work has not went without notice. Amen. We are blessed here today because of Sunday school teachers. I want to, amen. Amen. I want to thank every person who has given faithfully to the church. You have made the vision come to pass. I want to thank everybody that has persevered through ups and downs, the good, the bad, the happy, the sad, and the ugly. We are here today because of your faithfulness. Amen. And uh, I want, at the, the last thing I want to do uh, in thanking, I want to thank my wife and my kids today uh, because for the last, I don't know, year, year and a half, and while we've been getting serious about this and we've started construction and we've been in the process, you have put up with a lot of my frustration. And if you've not been present, if you've not been, or you may not understand, but you've, they've put up with my frustration. They've put up with my preoccupation. Uh, they've put up with long hours and me being absent. And uh, I appreciate everything they've done. I mean, if we could just. Amen. All right, enough of that stuff. There are still ways that you can give and you can help. If you've not put a dime in or if this is the first thing you've ever heard about it, there are still ways that you can give. I want you to throw a few things up here. You can help. You can help us with a floor cleaner. I promise you it'll be a lot easier. You can help with an ice maker. You can help us with a brand new washer and dryer. You can help with a new projector, a projector screen, dust mops, not them short ones, the big wide ones, and athletic equipment. Amen. Tables and chairs that look just like those in the pictures. All right. If you'd like to help, there'll be an opportunity to give today. And you can give at any time and we thank you. But now we're getting ready to start this service. I want to bring, okay, Brother Jonathan. Let's welcome him as he comes. Praise the Lord, church. So, Pastor has been doing a lot of thanking for the things y'all have done. And y'all have done a phenomenal work. Howsoever, it's pastor appreciation, and we want to thank you. In fact, there's a lot of y'all that have either had issues or you've been in the hospital and pastor came to see you. You were sick, pastor prayed for you. I recall a time I had COVID, and I thought, oh, I'm good. And as it went on, it progressively got worse. And pastor decided he was going to bring me a breathing treatment, a machine and treatment. And I knew I was doing a lot worse than I was letting on. And would you? And this is when it was everybody thought, you get it, you might die. And pastor came over, it didn't matter. He laid his hands on me and prayed for me. The next day it broke completely, was gone. But that's the kind of pastor we have that he spends a lot of time praying for us, a lot of time laboring for us. And we want to thank you. All right, this time Nathan's going to open the service up. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Brother, Brother Nix, we'll do the video at the end. Amen, I want to get into the service today.
Praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, before we go to prayer today and start this service, I'd like to say that uh, Thursday night before uh, yesterday's service, we had a prayer, and I sat there for the first hour that we started, and I asked God, I said, it's always the same people helping, and I feel we're getting wore down, and we're getting tired, and we're getting weary, and I said, when, when will we see the benefit of what we've been working for? always say to me but the harvest is ready the harvest is ready we've worked so hard but why not stop now we can't stop now because the harvest is ready just because the laborers are few doesn't mean that the harvest is not ready and it's plentiful too we have so much more ahead of us so much to look forward to if we just persevere and we keep going on I feel like it's been seven days it's been seven days and we've done seven laps around Jericho and we've had every step ordered and we've been in silence but this is the last day and it's the last lap and it's the last time we have to have our voice silenced. We're about to be heard in this community, heard in this state and heard in this world. God has more in store for us than we even know. Like the pastor said and the preacher said last night, God is as big as we're going to make him. He's as big as the box we're going to put him in. Let's remove that box and let him be as big as he needs to be. But at this time, let's go to prayer and start the service. God, thank you for everything you've done in this church and this community. God, thank you for the service we're having today and the opportunities we've been given. I ask God that you have your will and your way in this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
holy hands without wrath and doubting all across the sanctuary and let's just love God I don't care if you've come in here burdened I don't care if you've come in here shackled you're going to leave lifted up you're going to leave the chains broken but right now lift up what you got to the Lord lift up what you brought to the Lord right now in Jesus name I pray God that you would let the blessing begin to flow of your spirit in the house hallelujah we make it about you Lord Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. If the ushers would come, if you're here this morning, amen, and you've prepared a tithe or an offering, I want you to get that ready. I want you to make ready to bless the house of God, the kingdom of God. We've got some boys here praying, so I want you still praying. Oh, Lord, touch these children. I'm excited to be in a revival church. Amen. We're going to pray over the offering, and we're going to worship the Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for the day. We thank you for the hour that we're in and everybody that's gathered here together today with us, Lord. Bless those that have to give, Lord, those that not. God, help them, Lord, to one day be able to give and be faithful to your house somewhere, Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' name we pray. Let's bring our offering to the Lord. I can't. 
the Lord. Let's clap our hands and praise the Lord together. Amen. I'm aware of the time. It's about 20 minutes till 12 and there's a lot of food that's beckoning some of your appetites. But I'm asking you to be patient for the next few minutes as the man of God today Brother Davis brings a word for this church that's going to bless this church. I ask that you give him full attention. I ask that you keep your heart sensitive to what the Spirit of the Lord is going to say to this church. Let's greet him together today as he comes. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. It's an honor to be here with you all. What a privilege it is to uh, greet you again. What a time we had last night. Amen. It's a great, great move of God. The power of his presence was certainly in the room. And, uh, well, he's here today as well. Amen. And uh, we're going to um, move into the word of the Lord. Amen. It's an honor to be with you today as, um, as you celebrate the leadership of Pastor Bean and his family, and uh, thank God for this great, great legacy. Amen. Are you thankful for your pastor? Give him a great big hand. And to the bishop of this house and his wife, God bless you. Appreciate you all so very, very much, and uh, I did get to hear a little bit of her, uh, some would call it uh, teaching. It sounded like preaching to me, a little bit of her preaching this morning. And uh, we thank the Lord uh, for her passion. Amen. This great, great congregation. Amen. Bunch of good looking folks in the house today. So, so very happy that you are, that you are here. In honor of the word of the Lord, if you'll stand together with me for our opening text, let's go to uh, two passages of scripture. Let's look at Exodus chapter 1 and verse number 8. And then we will look at Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And, um, what a beautiful facility you have. Amen. Thank God for it. Amen. Uh, this is... Uh, this is gorgeous, uh, but I've been in your new facility as well, and wow, it is stunning. And we thank the Lord for a little bit of envy in me, because I'd like to have it. <laughs> and uh, uh, 
we're in uh, we're in a couple storefronts in, in Living Word Eclectic in Millbrook and Rockford, uh, three campuses that we pastor. And uh, uh, man, I walk in here and I'm like, maybe we can just settle for one and make it a big one like this. Beautiful, beautiful facility. We thank the Lord for it. Exodus chapter one, verse number eight. Um, I don't read scripture fast. I know that there's a a tendency for us to read the Bible through in a year, and I support that. I'm not opposed to it, but I think a lot of times we miss important stuff uh, when we read too quickly. And uh, I was reading Exodus chapter. Boy, I already feel the Holy Ghost. All right, uh, I was reading Exodus chapter one, and I was struck for days at verse number eight. It, it, it amazed me. And uh, that's where this sermon came from. Exodus 1 verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. How in the world does that happen? There arose up a new king over Egypt, Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Now turn to Joshua chapter 4. And let's look at verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass, Joshua 4, 1 through 7, it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. Twelve stones. Somebody say twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man, Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder. So it ain't a little stone. It's a big stone. You've got to put it on your shoulder according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, what do these stones mean? Then you'll answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Amen. With the help of the Lord, I want to preach to you for a little while from this subject, the answer for DK theory. The answer for DK theory. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to preach to amazing people. Thank you for this pastor and the leadership of this church. God, I pray you'd anoint me one more time to deliver this word to your people. Let it not return void, but accomplish what you've sent it to do. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. And somebody shout amen. amen. Are you going to help me preach for a little bit? You may be seated in the house of the Lord. The answer for DK theory. In his book, The Psychology of Learning in 1914, Edward Throndike coined a term that attempted to explain why the brain releases a memory causing us to forget. What is it that causes us to forget? The term that he coined is DK theory. DK theory is a physiological term which proposes that a memory fades due to the mere passage of time. Information that includes experiences becomes less available for later retrieval as time passes and memory strength fades away. The conclusion, then, is that the killer of a memory is time. Time is the culprit that robs us 
of the joy connected with meaningful moments. And the sad reality is that time is out of our control. Many psychologists agree that there is one way, however, to help slow the effects of decay theory. And the one, the one way is simply this. It is the art of rehearsal. For a memory to avoid being lost, we must intentionally rehearse it, relive it, re-experience it, and retell the story. My dad and mom both are, are in their, their 70s, and I love to talk with my dad. He recently had a stroke about five years ago, and, and uh, recovering from the stroke has been, uh, has been a challenge, to say the least. He was a minister for several years, preacher of the gospel, and now uh, he, he struggles some in those areas, and, and uh, he, he struggles a little bit uh, with, with memory with memory. But I love to sit down with dad and as we begin to talk, I will jog his memory. I will talk about 1954 Chevrolet and dad will begin to recite to me the color of it and the way that thing run. And how many barrels were on that carburetor and how fast that thing would fly. And the reason he was able to remember that moment is because I rehearsed in his memory a thought from years ago. If a memory is going to avoid being lost, we've got to be intentional about reliving the moment re-experiencing the moment, rehearsing the moment, and retelling the story. And hallelujah, this is what troubles me so much about this text in Exodus. This is what makes me so frustrated. It perplexed me for such a long time. It is potentially one of the most tragic verses in the context of the Exodus, Exodus 1 and 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. It's tragic. It's tragic. You will remember Joseph and his life-saving leadership of the nation of Egypt, a, a Pharaoh's dream and an anointed interpreter. Somebody say amen. Joseph, with God-given wisdom, strategically plans during seven years of plenty for seven years of drought. Do you remember? Storehouses are built and food taxes are levied. Crops flourished and the nation of Egypt under the leadership of Joseph prepares for the coming seven years of dearth, lack, drought, and famine. Please understand that had it not been been for Joseph, this drought most certainly would have been the death of the nation of Egypt. So how in the world is there a verse 8 that says there arose up a new king over Egypt which didn't know Joseph? How do you get there? How, how do you go from a hero to a zero in the eyes of a nation? Please understand as well that had it not been for Joseph, this historic drought most certainly would have been the death of those even beyond the borders of Egypt who were affected by this famine. But instead of death, there was government prosperity. <laughs> Joseph deals wisely for the advancement of Pharaoh. So how in the world is it remotely possible for a king to come to power with no knowledge of the influence of Joseph? And I propose to you today that Joseph was forgotten due to the effects of decay theory. Time removed from the famine changed their conversation. Abundance replaced lack and caused them to forget the pain. One generation led to another generation and slowly and methodically Joseph and his wisdom were forgotten. After all, who would want to rehearse over and over again the difficulty that our fathers endured yesterday when we are happy to dwell in the comforts of today? Now I believe 
God sent me to this pulpit today for a specific purpose, and that is to wage war against DK theory with the only weapon that we have against its destructive work. I feel obligated today not to preach a new profound message to you, but to this church I feel obligated to rehearse in your ears again a few ideas and doctrines that if we're not careful, they will be forgotten by the next generation. All it takes is one generation to stop preaching it and they will forever be lost. DK theory will rob us of important messages that you and I hold true and near and dear. I'm not going to be careful this morning. I was a little careful last night. I'm not going to be careful this morning. I'm going to preach it emphatically because I'm waging war against DK theory. And the first message that I want to preach loud and clear is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I got to preach it with everything that is in me. There is but one God and his name is Jesus. I need about 10 more to help me. If you'll help me, I'll preach faster and we'll get out of here. I got to tell you, it's got to be rehearsed over and over again. If we don't rehearse it, we will soon forget it and we will be a dying generation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is but one God. Verse 4 says, or 5, you should love that Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He said, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And then he tells us how to defeat DK theory. He said, teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on you. There is but one God. There is but one God there's but one God please listen to this preacher closely this, this one God revelation is not simply a denominational idea or concept this one God revelation is not simply a denominational idea or concept somebody say amen God understood that the temptation to distort his identity would evolve and morph Throughout history, he knew that decay theory would mess with it if we weren't careful. So he established as an unchanging principle, listen, he established as an unchanging principle whereby all theology must be approached. Our God is one. He said, before you even start studying about me and trying to figure me out, the basis of your study better be this declaration. There is but one God. There is but one God. There is but one God. In this ever-changing, progressive, ecumenical, religious culture that we are currently attempting to impact, you better get this message deep in your gut. I said, you better get it deep-rooted in your spirit. Do not allow time to rob us of this precious and powerful truth. Buddha is not your God. Islam, Zala, is not your God. The Greeks, God, Zeus, Athena, and Apollo are not the one true God. Krishna is not God. The Democrats are not your God, and neither are the Republicans. There is but one God, and he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm going to pause to in seconds and give you an opportunity to praise him with everything that is in you. Come on, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is in me. Come on, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Somebody shout one God. Now, before you're too quick to put this church or this pastor in any type of denomina uh, denominational category and label him too quickly and say, well, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm not preaching doctrine that is associated with organization or church ideology. What I'm preaching is biblical doctrine. You've got to contend with Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you've got to love him with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your might. Somebody shout hallelujah. The only way to forget, the only way to avoid forgetting, 
The only way that we can avoid forgetting it is to rehearse it over and over again. The only combat we have against DK theory is to rehearse it over and over again. we got to refuse to grow weary with this most powerful of revelations. When your pastor stands up to preach it, you better shout the aisles down. You better dance and give glory to God. Don't you dare let your children see you sit on the man of God when he preaches, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You better stand up and shout about it. You better tell your children, This is the word of the Lord. There's only one God. Don't you be deceived. I'm preaching in the Holy Ghost right now. Don't you be deceived. There's only one God. If we're not careful, DK theory will rob it from us. And it won't be long until the voices that are anti this understanding of Scripture will be louder than every other voice. And out of fear and intimidation, you will grow silent. And a world will be lulled into sleep as they worship at the altar of Kamala Harris or they worship at the altar of Donald Trump or they worship at the altar of a political party or they worship at the altar of a denominational ideology. I'm not preaching to you Pentecostal doctrine. I'm preaching to you Bible doctrine. Hero Israel. <laughs> the Lord our God is one. Somebody say he's one. Mm -mm. Pastor Bean, please, please whatever you do, don't tire of preaching that message. D don't get weary with that message. Because, Pastor, if you stop preaching it, then the next generation won't hear it. And eventually, DK Theory will rob it from us. Church, don't tire of hearing that message. The, the second message or doctrinal ideology that I think that you and I, biblical doctrine that you and I should embrace and hold. I touched on it last night. I'm going to touch on it again. Number two, point number two. Uh, the miraculous should be the norm. And I want, to pref I want to preface this second point with this statement. I do not know why God heals some people and he does not heal other people. I don't have that answer. But what I refuse to allow is my lack of understanding about God and his decisions to hinder me from believing that God is a healer. Did that make sense to you? In other words, if I pray for one who has cancer and the Lord chooses to take that one, I'm not going to curse God and get mad at him for not healing. I'm going to pray for the next one and God's going to heal that one. And at some point, God's going to get some glory. I wish y'all heard me preaching this because I feel it all over me. The miraculous should be the norm. We should celebrate the miraculous. We should anticipate the miraculous. Mark 16 and 17 is in your Bible, and you must contend with it. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Verse 18, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's in your Bible. Somebody say, my Bible. That's in your Bible. If I'm not careful, if I'm not careful, DK theory will rob it from me. And I'll start believing that God don't heal anymore. Because I've been battling sickness for a long time, I'll start wondering if God heals. Because I've been dealing with a particular disease, I'll wonder if God's a healer. Listen to me closely. Don't you ever doubt God in his word. If he heals, you better, or when he heals, you better praise him. But if he chooses not to heal, you still better praise him because he's a sovereign God and he knows what, I, why am I getting resistance right here? Let me come down here and preach it to you. I said he's a sovereign God and he knows what he's doing. He's got the whole world in his hand and I'm going to trust him and I'm going to believe that he's a healer. Somebody shout yes. Are you feeling what I'm feeling? I feel it. I feel it. This, this next point is one sentence long. And I'm going to hit it and move on. I had the privilege of sitting at your pastor's desk before service. And I, I read uh, 
an incredible article that I want a copy of, of how ministers are supposed to act. That uh, helpful tips for ministers. I love it. I want a copy of that. One of them said, leave certain topics to the pastor. And I loved that. I agree with it completely. So I ain't going to get specific. I'm going to let your pastor take care of that. But, but if we're not careful, and if we don't rehearse this, we're going to face a generation that, that forgets it. And the third point is this. Holiness is still right. I may need to take one of these out so I can hear you a little better. I, I said holiness is still right. I got one amen over here. I got some, I'm going to say it again. I said holiness is still right. You say, well, I don't know how I feel about all that holiness. How about you read Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14? How about you read that one? Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You can't even be saved without holiness. You got to come out from among the world. You got to be separate, saith the Lord. You can't talk like they talk. You can't walk like they walk. Yeah, you're staring at me and sitting there. Now you got me fired up. Now I'm going to get down here and preach it. You better believe there's a way that's right. You better believe there's a highway that's pure. You better believe that holiness is a mandate for my life. Well, preacher. Uh Uh-oh. Am I all right, pastor? Well, preacher, you know. God looks at the heart. Man. He looks at the outward appearance. I'd be ashamed to say that. If I knew that men were observing me by how I present externally and I want to represent Jesus well, I I better stop. I'm going to adhere to the rules of visiting preachers. Somebody shout holiness. And your says go, all right. Let, let me talk to you a little bit more then since Pastor gave me permission to talk. I'm not going to talk anything specifically. Uh, that, they'll leave that to him. But I do want you to understand that I don't go places that this world goes. And it isn't about it being wrong or right. It's about being, I want to represent Jesus well. I don't dress like the rest of this world. It's not about being wrong or right. It's because I want to be holy to God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to move, I'm going to move. But make no mistake, your Bible says that if there's no holiness in your life, you won't see the Lord. I don't care how many sinners' prayers you prayed. I don't care how many times you shook Billy Graham's hand. If you don't have holiness, you're not going to see God. Man, I'm in all kind of trouble right now. I feel like I'm back at home, but I'm going to preach it anyway. You need to quit worshiping men and start worshiping God. (laughs) I don't care what John Calvin had to say. I, I don't care what Martin Luther had to say. I don't care what Billy Graham had to say. I want to know what thus saith the word of the Lord. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know the word. I want to know what the word says. Give me the word. Preach the word to me. And if it says to come out from a up and be separate, then I'm going to come out from them. If five more of you would cut loose right now, the Holy Ghost would move in this place. I want to be holy. Somebody say hallelujah. Holiness is still right. Still right. Be seated. Let let me get to number four here. Holiness is still right. I don't care what the church up the street's doing. Pastor, I feel the Lord telling me to stay here just a minute. I'm going to help you. Is that all right? The Lord's telling me to stay here right here a minute now. If you disagree with this, that's fine. You're entitled to be wrong once in a while. If you read through the epistles, here's what you'll notice. 
that the Apostle Paul said some things to the Corinthian church that he didn't say to the church at Galatia. Let me say it again. Paul said some things to the church at Corinth that he didn't say to the church at Galatia. Now, before you think they had email, and when Paul sent a letter to Corinth, they shipped it to all the other churches. They may have on occasion, but do you know it's like 1,900 miles from Ephesus to Corinth or from one church to another? When all you got's a donkey, it don't get there too quick, right? Maybe a ship on occasion takes some time to get there. So when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said some pretty specific things. But if you look at the cultural context, you will understand that a lot of what Paul was saying was related directly to their culture. And he didn't deal with it in the Galatian church because he wasn't having that issue in the Galatian church. Y'all ain't going to help me and I'm going to preach it anyway. And the Lord spoke to me because I asked God why. Why would Paul say some things to the Corinthian church that he didn't say to the Galatian church? And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said because Paul was the pastor of that church. And he pastored those specific churches in the ways that they needed to be pastored. There are some churches that don't need you to preach against certain things. But there are other churches where that's a struggle. And the pastor's got to preach against it. So don't you dare start comparing your pastor's stance on holiness with the preacher up the road. Well, Pastor Bean, we went and visited Brother So-and-So's church, and they don't require all that over there, and, and they don't make everybody do that. It's not your business to observe the God calling of another preacher. you got to submit to your man of God and say, preach the word to me. Boy, that was tough right there. I'm moving. One sentence turned into a big one, didn't it? Point number four. I'm getting in all kind of trouble today. Point number four. You better hear this because I'm finna say it. If you're not careful, we'll lose this. And right now in this ecumenical movement that is coming around where everybody's non-denominational and just come as you are and do what you want and act how you want as long as you bring your wallet, Notice none of those ecumenical churches are saying leave your wallet at home. (laughs) But they're saying you can dress however you want and talk however you want, walk however you want, live however you want, but but just bring your wallet when you come to church. That's that's funny to me. none None of this ecumenical movement is saying leave your wallet at home. But but they're conforming, they're they're compromising because they they want in your pocket. Thank God for a pastor that'll preach the truth if you stay or walk out. Thank God for a pastor that's committed to the words of Paul to Timothy. Preach the word, man. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. Give heed to the word of God. Don't preach because there's people there. Preach if nobody's there. Preach if only five show up. Okay, all right. All right, I'll quit that. I, I'm trying. Point number four is this. Listen closely. Demonstrative worship is the will of God in this church. I'm going to say it again. Demonstrative worship is the will of God in this church. And not only this church, in my church and in every church everywhere. Well, Pastor Darren, Pastor Bean, I'm not the emotional type. Hogwash. Every person was created with emotion. And if I had a nice long conversation with your wife in private, she'd probably tell me how emotional you can get sometimes. But then we come to church and sit on the seat and we're unmoved by the power and presence of God. And we've got to be entertained in order to be moved. I'm starting to get real comfortable here. It may be my last time, so let me just preach like I feel it. I'm just old enough, Bishop, to remember. I'm just old enough to remember those services where the glory of God stepped in the back door and somebody would jump to their feet and they begin to dance in the spirit. 
Notice I said they danced in the spirit. They didn't dance to choreograph music with, with somebody in their earbuds saying now's the time to jump and now's the time to go. I'm talking about somebody that when the Holy Ghost hit them on they couldn't cut. Do you remember them old time meeting? Somebody feeling what I'm preaching right now. Somebody feeling what I'm preaching. You feeling it. You feeling what I'm preaching. She feeling what I'm preaching. You, you remember them old time days? You remember them kind of services where all of a sudden bobby pins started flying everywhere and hair started getting out of shape and people didn't care what kind of suit they were in. They, Lo and behold, some some sister became a helicopter and woo, and began to praise the Lord. Anybody hearing me preach this? And instead of reliving and talking about it and mentioning it over and over again. Did you see what just happened when I just started reminiscing with you? Do, do, do you remember when I just started reminiscing with you? I didn't really give you any reason to get excited. I just started talking about old mama and them, you know, when the service would start. And they did that. None of them could sing a lick. Do you remember? None of them could sing a lick. And mama would get on the piano, and it was out of tune. And she'd sing, I'll fly away, oh glory. And as she began to sing, I'll fly away, some dear sister, the Holy Ghost got her. I will be willing to tell you that the people that are responding right now at this portion of the service just relived a moment in their yesterday. And what concerns me is that some of you are saying that preacher's crazy. And the reason you think I'm crazy is because you ain't never been there before. But if you've ever been in that moment where the hair on the back of your head started standing up and you didn't know why it was happening. You say, oh, that's just Pentecostals. Oh, shut your mouth. The Methodists used to shout the church down. The Baptists used to shout the church down. Every major denomination used to shout the church down. They felt the glory of God and they responded. Ah, if I had an organ right now, I'd go plumb nuts. But I got to tell you, there's something about getting your praise on. There's something about worship. There's and I'm going to give you 10 seconds to get out of your seat and bless the Lord. Is that all you got, my brothers? Is that all you got, my sisters? Decay theory is going to win if you don't get your praise back. I am troubled by a generation that don't know how to worship unless there's a beat on the drum. When was the last time? When was the last time you worshiped not because the music was right, but because the Holy Ghost was here? When was the last time you could get lost in his presence when the lights were on full blast and nobody was singing your favorite song? Decay theory is killing us. I said decay theory is killing us. And it's robbing us in a lot of areas. But one place it's robbing us of right now is in our worship. And you're not you. I'm going to talk about people now, Pastor. Some people are so scared to worship because they're afraid of what people think about them. And the problem with that is you're not worshiping God then. You're worshiping the opinions of others. I don't care how you feel about me. My God's worthy. I said, my God's worthy. He picked me up out of a miry clay. Oh, Jesus. I'm also convinced that the reason people don't worship is because some preachers convinced them they've been picked up out of the miry clay, but they never got picked up out of the miry clay.
Let me preach to you that repentance is not an option. Repentance is mandated. Is anybody going to help me for a few more minutes here? I know it's 1215. I'm supposed to be done. But can I have a few more minutes? I, I'm feeling so good in the Holy Ghost. Hopefully the food will keep. I just got to preach it here. I said maybe we need to repent and feel what it feels like to have our sins taken off of us again. And when they come off of you, you can't help but praise him. We don't need more music. We need more Holy Ghost. Mark 14, 3, and being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, a spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box, and she poured it on his head. That might just be a story to you, but with no regard for what the men in that room would say, with no regard for the mocking words of Jesus' own disciples, with no care for what others would think of her motive, she burst into the room. She fell at his feet, and she worshipped. You say, Pastor, what's it, Brother Davis, what's it going to take? What's it going to take to have revival at our church? Do we need more programs, better singing? Do we need better worship? All oh, that's good. Don't, don't get me wrong in that. But John 4, 23 tells us the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers. So where there is a true worshiper, there's a false worshiper. And the Bible says that he's looking for true worshipers. Oh, I got so many pages here. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. In our text, you, you can be seated. You'll, you'll remember the story of Joshua. He, he brings out, I'm, I'm closing. I'm trying. Lord, help me, Jesus. You, you'll remember the story of Joshua. He brings order to the people of God. You remember as he prepares them to cross the Jordan into the land of promise. And the Bible says that when the priest's feet touched the water, that God disrupted the flow and he parted the waters and this nation of people walked into their promised land on dry ground. But in our text in Joshua 4, it came to pass when, verses 1 through 7, it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan. The Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Find you twelve men and every, out of every tribe a man, and tell them to go back into the midst of that sea and to get them a stone, not a pebble, not one they can hold in their hand, but get a stone that they can carry on their shoulder and bring it over here mm. and have them put it in a pile. He said, have them put it in a pile. Verse 6 tells us why. That pile will be a sign among you. I propose to you that that pile of rocks was the answer to DK theory because I propose to you that as one year turn to the next turn to the next turn to the next that a generation of young people rose up and they don't know nothing about crossing the Red Sea and they don't know nothing about are y'all hearing me preach they don't know nothing about deliverance from Egypt. They've heard the stories, but they didn't walk the road. And the longer they got removed from their deliverance, the less they talked about it until Daddy and Nathan right? Until daddy and Nathan hand in hand are down walking by the old sea and Nathan says, daddy what's that pile of rocks? And that pile of rocks jogged a memory in daddy's mind. Thank you. And he said, I remember granddaddy told me a story that his grandpa told him. Come on, music. I, I just want piano and one singer. Come on. I don't, I don't want anything else. I, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong. There's a pile of rocks. What does it mean, daddy? And it jogged a memory in daddy's mind. And daddy thought back to what grandpa said. 
He said, Grandpa told me a story. He said, I guess the story goes like this, son. We were on that side. We were in bondage. We were defeated. We were slaves. Are y'all hearing me? But now, we're in freedom. And the story is that when the people of God step their feet in the water on that side, are y'all hearing this? That the waters parted and they walked through on dry ground. Well, Daddy, do you believe it happened like that? Son, I wasn't there. But from the looks of those stones, they came out of the middle of that river. Came out of the middle, let's see. And forever, there was a testimony to the next generation that our God is a delivering God. There's so much Holy Ghost in this room right now. Do you feel what I feel? I've only, I've only known. Somebody praise the Lord right now. Somebody praise the Lord. Come on, somebody praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That was a patty cake. Somebody praise the Lord. When the gifts of the Spirit make us uncomfortable, it's an indication that decay theory has already took a hold of us. I'm going to say that again because the people in the cheap seats need to hear it. When the gifts of the Spirit make us uncomfortable, it's an indication that decay theory has already got a hold of us. The gifts of the Spirit moved so much in the Apostle Paul's day that Paul had to give instructions on how it was to be done. Now we never have them. And when we do, we get uncomfortable with them. Because DK theory done grabbed us. Let me close. I love your pastor. He's a very dear friend of mine. Oh, are we? You heard it. You heard it, Rev. He's a dear friend of mine. Will he hear me when I say that? Bishop, can you hear me? You can hear me. Thank God. Come here, Brother Bean. got a mic and everything. Yeah, better be careful. How many years? Twelve. Twelve years as a pastor of this church. Brother Bean is a fireball preacher. Great pastor. Thank God for him. But let me tell you something. He didn't get this on his own. Y'all didn't hear me. I'm going to say it again. He didn't get this on his own. Bishop, can you come help me? I, you knew it was coming. I'm sorry. Come on. Come help me, Bishop. I... Now, that, that's your daddy, right? He's the former pastor. Okay. Come on, Bishop, right here. Thank you, sir. We love and respect you and honor you. Let me tell you. 
Come on, Bishop's wife. Act like you love that man. Close to him. He's a good man. Now watch this. How many years? 52 here? You've been married 52. How long you pastor here? 23 years as the, pa right, as the pastor of this church. Let me tell you something. He preached the same message I preached to you today. And this man is preaching the same message that that man preached. And I heard rumor that there's a bean before this one. I think my daddy knew the bean before this one. The, the, the real bishop. Gone on to his reward. That bishop picked up a pile of stones. He didn't have a nice building like this. He, a one room. He didn't have the new facility you've got. He, did, he probably had an old out-of-tune guitar and somebody that could barely sing. But when they started church, they came in preaching one God. They came in preaching holiness. They came in preaching truth. And guess what? He stacked up a pile of stones that his boy saw. And then his boy took his son by the hand and said, here's a pile of stones, boy. Don't you dare forget it. And look at here. Young old ruddy boy. Wet behind the ears, still ain't got it all together. He's going to make more mistakes. Plenty more to come. And I don't know what the future is of this church. And I'm not prophesying about future leadership. But what I am prophesying is this. That from one generation to another generation to another generation to another generation and your boy to another generation there's a pile of stones that will fight against DK theory stand with me all over this house stand with me thank you bishop I love you stand with me all over this house stand with me stand with me stand with me stand with me Lord Jesus 15 minutes longer than I should have preached. I'm done. That's it. You are one wrong leadership decision away from becoming a charismatic, unrecognizable church. One wrong leadership decision. So church, you better say, Pastor, preach the word to me. Preach holiness to me. Preach one God to me. Preach worship to me. Put up some stones for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. I got to ask if there's anybody in this church uh, that will stand with the man of God right now in the word that's been declared today. And you will rush this altar. You will run to this altar. In a sign of commitment, would you come right now, right now, right now? I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm committed. Where are you? Where are you? I'm committed. I'm committed. Preach the truth. Build a wall. Lay the stones. We're going to have have revival. We're going to see a move of God. Decay theory is not going to destroy us. We're going to have revival. You ought to praise him like it's 1925. Somebody honor the Lord. Me not, oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry While on others thou art calling Do not pass me by I'm 
calling you Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling to would you lift your hands and let the Holy Ghost flow over you today? Let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief kneeling there in deep country just Lord help my unbelief and the church knows how to sing unto the Lord we say Savior Savior hear my humble cry while on others thou art called not do that's okay let the tears flow somebody let the tears flow I'm calling you I'm calling Savior Savior pray for your brother pray for your sister right now find somebody that's struggling right now and they're crying out to God for help while on others there's thou art I'll say, Savior, say. Brother Kevin, I want you to lay hands on her in the name of Jesus. Lord, begin to let the Holy Ghost overflow her right now. Come on, Sister Charity. Come on, pray right now in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, let the Holy Ghost fall upon somebody. Do not pass. Do not pass me by. Oh, I see a crimson stream of blood. Oh, it flows from... This is what Pentecost feels like, if you didn't know. Hallelujah! It's way which reached the throne of God. How sweet be no On Calvary's hill of sorrow, where sin's demands were paid, and rays of hope for tomorrow across our paths were laid. And I see a crimson stream. Sometimes it's just to go good to go back and get a fresh dose of the Holy Ghost. A fresh outpouring. A fresh touch of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our sweet sister Donna. Somebody bring me the elder. Come on, elder. In the name of Jesus. I see a crimson stream of blood. Just like Caleb when he was eight, he said, I can still take the mountain. Oh, we've been through a lot. But God's got us the rest of the way, I promise you. The last leg of the journey that God's got it. He's got it in Jesus. I see a crimson stream. Oh, the Lord still got us. He still got us. It flows. It flows. It flows. His ways which reach the throne of God are sweeping. Are sweeping. 
will close with this. Ask me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Clap your hands to the Lord. All right. Right now, there's somebody praying. Let's lift our hands. Somebody's seeking the Lord right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that your spirit would begin to fall right now in the name of the Lord. I pray that there be a baptism of the Holy Ghost would fall on that lady. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, God, that the power of the Holy Ghost that is in this place, that is upon us, God, would fill us, God. Your word says that there's one God, one Father of us all, in us all and through us all. Lord, let her be filled with the power of the Spirit of God. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 I want to see if you guys remember something. About two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, when we kicked off this building project, there was a video or a little thing we played. And it seems now like ancient history. But I want to remind you, with hearing the same voices you heard a year and a half ago, that if you'll put your faith in God and you'll get behind the things of God, nothing's impossible. Hit, play it for us. God is bringing a lot of seasoned ministers into this church for a preparing for the harvest that is now. The world's only getting worse. The time to reach your family and friends is now. Now is the time for revival. Our first addiction recovery class had eight people in attendance. Last week we had 16. We're making an impact around this community now is the time for revival our youth group has grown so much through this revival now is the time to go out into our city and neighborhoods inviting neighbors friends and family to church our youth group's time is now looking back over the past few years i can clearly see how god has intentionally moved people and families into place to facilitate the revival that's happening now it almost feels like everything, every victory and defeat, every joy and sorrow, every gain and loss has been building up to this moment, now. You're never too young to help out in God's house. Start now. As we enter into the new building program, I believe now is the time to prepare for our future. The revival that we are in has been an amazing work of God, and I believe will continue. Now is the time to prepare the building for services to be held because this sanctuary will not hold us long after the new building. Amen. Now, God is doing something in this church. We're going to pray over the food. Then I'm going to dismiss you into the other building. Make sure you let the elderly people and the older ones eat. Make sure you allow them careful. Help them, please. Make sure our guests are allowed to get at the front of the line too. Let's pray over our food. In Jesus, your wonderful name, we pray and ask your blessings over the food and the fellowship today. Thank you for your presence that's been in this house. We give you glory, praise, and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.